Okay, so Acts chapter 17. Here's what we're doing. And, and again, I hope I, I didn't get one myself, but I hope you got one of the handouts in the back because what we're doing, and I hope you all have been following along on our Wednesday night classes. Uh, we have been investigating uh, Paul's missionary journeys over the last, what, six weeks, seven weeks? Can't remember how many weeks we've been on Paul's missionary journeys. Uh, but we basically did just an overview look at each of his journeys, not an in-depth study of them, but just kind of a snapshot view of his journeys, uh, each one of them, just to see what was happening, what were some of the major things that went on with that. And I hope that, uh, I hope that the, the three handouts, hopefully that you got online, either on our page or uh, somewhere else, hopefully the three pages that you got, one for each journey, uh, I'd recommend that you hang on to those. To me, those are helpful little pieces of information that are just a snapshot overview of each of the journeys. Uh, but as we were going through them, I intentionally left out a section out of each of those journeys, thinking we might have to come back and uh, look at some other things. So last week, we dissected uh, a sermon from Paul's first missionary journey, uh, the sermon that he preached in Antioch of Pisidia at, back in chapter 13. We dissected that sermon last week. So tonight, we're going to be dissecting the sermon that he preached in Athens in Acts chapter 17. Um, and uh, as I mentioned last week, Dissecting sermons is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, you may think that's kind of weird, uh, but I had biology. I had all those classes where I dissected animals, and that was pretty cool too, uh, you know, pulling all of those things out and trying to identify each of those pieces and parts that were inside of those animals. That was kind of interesting. So, uh, but I've taken that and said, okay, what can we do with sermons to try to take them apart, especially Bible sermons, but I like doing this with other sermons too, just trying to take them apart and see how are these things put together and what are the major points and how are the major points being supported. And uh, for those of you who were at leadership training camp that we've had for the last 20 years, or you've had your children at leadership training camp that we've had for the last 20 years, that's what we do in sermon crafting, lesson crafting. It's how do you put things together? So if you've got the handout, we're in Acts chapter 17. And uh, generally when I'm taking notes, uh, if I'm taking notes in a sermon, which I would recommend, by the way, if you want to be a preacher's favorite listener, take notes in a sermon, uh, and it will make him happy. Uh, so uh, when I take notes in a sermon, generally I'm writing up in the top right, who's doing the preaching, where am I, what's the setting, and what's the date. I'm writing up over in the top left of the page the title of the sermon and the text of the sermon. That just helps me when I come back and look at it later. So that's the general, here's the top page when I'm taking notes. When I'm taking notes in a sermon, here's the top page. Uh, over in the left-hand side, um, who's doing the preaching? If it's Dan Jenkins, if it's Josh Blackmer, if it's Dan Winkler, if it's uh, uh, B.J. Clark, whoever it is, who's doing the preaching? Who's doing the preaching in Acts 17? The Apostle Paul. That's not hard to figure out. What's the date? Well, we don't have a specific uh, June 3rd, 2020, but it's somewhere around 50 to 51 uh, A.D. is uh, the general time reference. Where is he? Uh, where, where is he when he's preaching this sermon? We know he's in the city of Athens, uh, and it's believed that he is on Mars Hill uh, in Athens. And uh, uh, June, have you been to Mars Hill? Yes, I, I, I knew you had to have been to Mars Hill. Talk to June about Mars Hill. And any time somebody does, goes on a, on a Bible lands journey uh, and goes to Athens and is there at Mars Hill, oftentimes there'll be some preacher there who will get Acts chapter 17 out and read this sermon. Um, to, to think about what it was like when Paul was there doing the preaching, and he's preaching to, who's the audience here? Uh, the audience here are some philosophers, uh, some individuals. When, when you think about philosophers, what do you think about? When you hear somebody's a philosopher, what do you think? What? Plato, Socrates. Plato, Socrates. What do you think about philosophers? What do you think about philosophers? Say it again. Fluffy thinkers. All right. So we just, we're just laying it all out here. So philosophers are fluffy thinkers. Um, that's, that, 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 Nicole, can you imagine Nicole Friesman's dictionary of terms and, uh, and, and what that would look like? Um, you think about philosophers. And uh, here, here are people who are high-minded individuals. Here are people who like to think, and they like to tell others what they think. Uh, and they like to convince others that what they're thinking is what they need to be thinking. That, you know, here's some, here are some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers who are coming to Paul and saying, hmm, we're interested in this new doctrine. 
uh, that, you, that you are teaching. Look, are you in Acts chapter 17? What, is, what do they say in verse 19? They took Paul, brought him to the Areopagus. Uh, that's what the New King James says. Your Bible might say Mars Hill. Uh, and they said to him, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, and we want to know more uh, of what these things mean. Go back up to uh, verse 18, where there were some of them who were saying, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. Why did they think Paul was a proclaimer of foreign gods? According to that verse, who's he preaching? According to that verse, who's he preaching? Verse 18. He's preaching to them about Jesus. And they say he's preaching about foreign gods. Why would they think that? Because Jesus is preaching about God, about Jesus, and it's somebody they'd never heard of before, so he's foreign. Jesus is foreign to them. And so he comes along and they say, hmm, this is a new doctrine. Now notice what it says about them in verse, four, in verse 21. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. You know any people like that today? They're not interested maybe in the old paths of things. They're just interested in some new fangled way of understanding something or some new fangled way of doing something instead of the... And so if there's any, anything that's old paths or old time, well, we don't have time for that. Uh, here are some people in the, in the Bible that they just want to hear new things. Well, this was new to them. What Paul was about ready to preach to them was something that was new to them. Now, what did Paul notice? As he's going through the city of Athens, what does he notice? What does he see a lot of in the city of Athens? A lot of idols. Lots of idols. It, it was estimated by one historian that during the time of Nero, which is pretty close to this, a little before the time, but during the time of Nero... It was estimated by one historian that there were 30,000 idols in, in Athens, not including the ones people had in their homes, just public idols, 30,000 idols and 10,000 residents. Figure that out. You've got a population of 10,000 people and an, and an estimated number of idols, public idols, 30,000. No wonder when Paul's walking through, he sees more idols than he sees people. Uh, and so, but then he comes and he finds... An idol to who? The unknown God. And when Paul sees that, you know, sometimes, sometimes a preacher will, will take an object to take something that's familiar with somebody and say, let me talk to you, let me start my lesson by, by addressing this and bring it to you, bring this to you in a lesson that you can understand, but hopefully a lesson that helps you to become a better person. And that's what Paul's doing here. So, title of this lesson. The title I would give to this lesson is The One True God. That's, and, and if you wanted an extended, a little bit longer title, The One True God is Not Unknown. They had an idol to the unknown God. And Paul says there is one true God, and what he gets ready to tell them, he goes on to tell them is, and he's not unknown, he's made himself known. Uh, and obviously the text is, is what we're looking at here. If I'm taking notes on a sermon, I always write down what is the, what's the scripture reading, what's the major text uh, that the preacher is using, uh, just, to, just for my reference point. Obviously, uh, this sermon starts in verse 22, goes down through verse 31. So, that's just the basics. That's just kind of the basics intro into this sermon. As I look at his sermon, I see four major points uh, and uh, we had three major points last week. I see four major points uh, in, in this particular lesson, and they're not of equal length, uh, but you start in verse 22 is where the, where the sermon starts. You get down to verse 24, and you see this on your handout. Uh, you get down to verse 24, and I think that's, wh that's where the real heart of the sermon starts is in verse 24, um, and, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. You get down to verse 27, and he, he begins that verse by saying, so that pointing out the purpose for everything that he's just said. I think, he's, I think you could say that's another major point there. And then down in verse 30, he starts the verse with the word truly, uh, which I, begin, I think he's starting to make some real application to their lives. So perhaps four major points uh, in this particular sermon. Point number one. And again, Paul is, Paul is beginning at a some kind of a common ground that they understand, and he's going to build a sermon from there. 
Point number one is that the one true God, He is distinct from all others. If there were 30,000 idols, if there were 30,000 idols in this city, and then there's one over here to the unknown God. What, what, what did that mean to the Athenians? That, huh? Any that, that's it. Any that we missed. We've got all of these other gods because everything is a God and God is everything to them. All is God and God is all. So we've got a God for everything. And oh, what if we missed one? Oh, here's an idea. If we missed one, we'll just say it's to the unknown God. Paul comes along and says, excuse me. He's not like all of these other gods, and he's going to develop that beautifully. He's not like all of these other gods. He is distinct from all of these other gods. And so he lets them know it is not enough to be religious. Look at verse 22. Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. Was that good enough? Yeah, they're religious. They're 30,000 times more religious than most people. You're very religious. Is that good enough? No, that, that doesn't work. Uh, and it's not enough to, and I've got this in my terminology, to cover your bases religiously. That's what they're doing. When, when, you've got a, you, when you've got an idol to, oh, in case we missed one, what are you doing? Well, you're covering your base. You don't want to make the gods angry. That would that'd be a big mistake. Don't make the gods angry. So in case we forgot somebody, we've got one for over, over here for you. Some people approach religion that way. Some people approach Christianity that way. Well, let's just make sure we got all of our bases covered. Uh-uh. Paul says that it's not a matter of covering all of your bases, and it's not a matter of just worshiping. I mean, they worshiped all of these gods, and, and, and evidently they even worshiped the unknown God. Well, is that good enough? They were worshiping the unknown God. Well, at least they were worshiping him. Is that good enough? It's not good enough to worship God, but still do it in ignorance. And there's, there's a whole lesson there. But verse 23, Paul says, I was passing through and considering the objects. Do you see the S on the end of the word object in verse 23? I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. Is that a good thing? He doesn't say I was considering the object, singular, of your worship. I saw all of the plurality of 30,000 objects of your worship and I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, look at the end of verse 23. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Who does Paul proclaim to them? Look, the very first part of verse 24. Some translations just have God. Some of your, in New King James, what I've got here, just has the word God at the beginning of verse 24. Other translations, instead of just the word God, have what? The God. And the definite article is there in the Greek. That when Paul comes to, to the point, and, and when, when he begins verse 24, I think he's starting the beginning of the, the, the heart of his sermon. And what he's saying when you get to verse 24 is, I'm not talking to you about a God. That would, that would be a waste of my time and a waste of your time to talk about a God. Paul says, I'm here to talk about the God. And when we come to understand the God, Paul says, we don't need to treat him like he is a God. Why? He is distinct. The God is distinct from any other God that somebody might put out there. What would you think if you were there in Athens and you heard Paul start the sermon? This, this is just the introduction of his sermon. You're there in Athens and you hear Paul start his sermon this way. Are you intrigued? Are you listening? They ask the question. I mean, Paul's, Paul's only there answering their, would you tell us this new doctrine? I mean, that's, that's like saying sick them to a preacher. When, when you say, huh, well, would you come over here and preach to us what you've been preaching? Hmm, well, let me check my calendar and see when I can fit you in. No, it's like, hello, open opportunity. So Paul comes over and says, oh yeah, by the way, I want to talk to you not about some God, I want to talk to you about the God. 
That's a message none of these people had ever heard. What, what he's about ready to tell them is, is just is going to be so foreign to everything they've ever heard. Is that what made it true? Was, was, was what made it true the fact that it was brand new to them? Was what made it true the fact that it was foreign to them? They had never heard it before? No, what made it true was what made it true. What made it true is that this is the God. And Paul, he, he, he's going to get to this major part of his sermon. He's not just going to say that, that God is distinct from all. The major focus of his sermon right here in this point is that he's the creator of all. These people had no concept of that. They had zero concept that God was the creator of all. And so that's, in, in my mind, this is, this is kind of the heart of his sermon. So look in verse 24. First point of, and he's going to have about, what do you have on your sheets? Eight points here? He makes eight points about God in just three verses. Don't you wish you knew a preacher who could make eight points in only three verses? So, verse 24, the God who did what? Who made the world and everything in it. What did he make the world and everything in it out of? What did he use? He just, he just spoke it into existence. He didn't start with something and then mold it and, and, and manipulate it into something else. He made everything out of nothing. Who can, who can do that? Who can make everything out of nothing? And yet, that's what he did. When, when, you look at, when you look at the precision of things that are around us, is that a sign of accident or is that a sign of design? I mean, it's not a sign of an accident happening. Here's Paul saying the very first thing about, his, about God. He made the world and everything. He's starting in Genesis chapter 1. He made the world and everything in it. What does that say, first of all, about evolution? Is, 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 is evolution, does that fit into he made the world and everything in it? It, it, it doesn't fit. Did the, did the world create itself? It, it can't create itself. It was made. Now, what else do we learn about God? He's not only the creator of all, uh, and it's interesting to me, how many times you have the word all or the word every in this sermon? Uh, Paul, is, Paul uses those terms frequently through this sermon. Uh, but he not only created all, he rules over all. Verse 24 says, since he, God, is Lord of heaven and earth. I know we rip right through this and we just read right through it. But I want you to think about each one of these phrases dropping on these people's minds for the first time. That unknown God, the one that you're ignorant of, that's who I'm going to tell you about. He is the God. What did he do? He made everything. What? He made everything? Okay, he not only made everything, he rules over everything. He's in control. What does that say about the other, if there were 30,000 exactly, what does that say about the other 29,999 idols that were there? Do they rule over everything? No. No. He rules over heaven and earth. Now, it's interesting down at the end of verse 24, says that he does not dwell in temples made with hands. What does that mean? Doesn't dwell in temple. I thought God did dwell in a temple in the Old Testament. I thought he dwelt in an in a, in a inner chamber of a tabernacle. What does Paul mean that he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands? He's not physical. Did God dwell within? Did, did God come and, and have his presence dwell in the Holy of Holies? Yes, he did. Was that the only place God was? Was in the Holy of Holies? Well, no. But that's where he made his presence known to his people. And yet God was omniscient in all places, even at that time. What's he saying about these idols? When, when he says... When he talks to them about God transcends everything, the fact that he does not dwell in temples made with hands. What about the 29,999 of these other gods? They're limited. They dwell in a house. 
that was made for them. And, and, and he's not done talking. He's not done talking about these idols. Look at verse 25. Nor is he, the God, verse 25, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. That's an, that's an interesting way to say that. He's not, he is not worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. What does that mean? Is, I, I thought he is worshipped by man. Isn't he worshipped with men's hands? Exactly. He is contrasting the God with the idols. Where did these idols find their origin? Where did they come from? Men's hands. <laughs> man made the idols, and then man bowed down to those idols. That makes sense, right? But not only did man make these idols, man came along and put clothes on his idols. And man brought food and laid it down before his... Uh, whatever happened to that food? They brought food and they laid it down. What is he saying? Those idols could be nothing without man. Well, then who's God in that situation? If those idols could be nothing without man, then those idols are, cannot be anything without the service of man. What's Paul saying about the God? He's the God, regardless of what man does. He not, he, he not only transcends all, he, he sustains everything, regardless of what, whether man serves him or not. That's, that's again, that, that's just totally different than what these idolaters would think. Because they're, they're totally physical. They're totally, well, we made these idols and, and they're nothing without us. And if, if, if they fall over, we've got to pick them up and, and we've got to clean them off. And, and you know, when, when they get dirty, we have to, what? And that's your God? Each, each one of these phrases is not just something, again, we would zip right through this. But I don't think Paul zips through. I think he's just got to stop and let these things sink in. Their idols are enhanced. Their, their little g-gods are enhanced by man's service. The God is God. He's not enhanced by my service at all. But I am. I am enhanced by my service. And, and so it's completely backwards from what they would think. Look at verse 25, where he says, uh, the end of verse 25, since he gives to all... Life, breath, and all things. Where did man come from? Man got his life, got his breath. Man gets all things from God. Again, that's totally foreign, totally different than what these people would have thought before. And yet, he wants them to know that God is the, he's the life giver. Evolutionists don't believe that life comes from life. But one of their, the law of science, the law of biogenesis, says life has to come from life. Life can never come from non-life. So what does Paul say? That's where life came from. Life came from the ever-living God. But here's, I want you to think about verse 26. And I, I, want, I want the first part of verse 26 to sink in for a little bit. He has made from one. And I know some Bibles have the word blood, but the word blood is not really in the original, so I just want you to let it be one, like one man, one person. He has made from one every nation to dwell on the face of the earth. Where did all of these nationalities come from? Where did the Jews and the Gentiles come from? Where did all of these different ethnicities come from? Where did blacks and whites come from? According to this verse, where did they come from? They all came from one man. God cre In the beginning, God created man. And from that one, the, the word one here is, 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 in ma is masculine, from this one man, God made all nations. 
So therefore, within the, within the genetic code of that one man were all races that would ever come from that one man. Which race is better? Which race is inferior? That's a stupid question. Because they all come from one. And if they all come from one, nobody's greater, nobody's lesser. Everybody's the same. And again, if you're an Athenian, if, 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 you're, if you're a Greek in that day, the Greeks look down upon others. And Paul's saying, nope. You're all just the same. No difference between you. Was it up through World War I or World War II? Can't remember. I, I, I used to know and now I just now I've lost my confidence in which it is. It was either through World War I or World War II. I think it was World War II, wasn't it? Where they were still separating the blood from the whites and the blood from the blacks because they 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 thought that they you didn't want to cross mix those and give them to the wrong person. Is there any difference in the blood flowing between, in, in anybody's body depending on what your outside looks like? Nope. Doesn't matter what your outside looks like. The inside looks all the same. That's why when a surgeon goes in to do surgery, guess what? He's going to find the same stuff in the same place. And he's going to find blood in there. From one man. We do well. We do well to remember the God. And what he did in making us. And to see that we are all, guess what? We're all related. You're, 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 you're related to me somehow. Sorry. Some, somewhere back there, we are connected. All right? And you, you might want to distance yourself and say, well, you know, he, we, we kind of disowned him. But, well, too, too bad. We, we are connected. So, but everybody is connected. That's the way God made us. From one per, and there, there's unity in that. We got five minutes. I got to keep going. Verse 26 also says, He made all of these people to dwell on the face of the earth. He gave them dominion over it. If you read Genesis chapter 1, uh, He gave the earth to mankind to dwell upon it. And then the end of verse 26 says, And has determined their pre appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. What does that mean? That means God's sovereign. That means God is, he had already said that he's Lord of heaven and earth, but now he's talking about these nations. He's talking about these world powers, and he's saying that God providentially rules over the affairs of men. God, God, is, God is involved in the rise and the fall of nations and governments. And even this says, to the extent in which certain nations conquer other nations, God's involved in that, and he uses them for his purpose. Read the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel just it, it emphasizes that repeatedly, especially you read chapter 2, read chapter 4, where it talks about the most high rules in the affairs of men, the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he wishes. That's something we might think, oh, that was only in Bible times that he did that. Daniel doesn't, put, Daniel doesn't put an expiration date on those statements. God is sovereign. I don't know how he works. You don't know how he works. And we certainly don't know why certain things happen the way that they do. But Paul wanted these individuals to know that the God, not some stinking idol that they had made out of their hands, but the God was sovereign over world power. So, I want you to be an Athenian. Whoa! He's not like any of these other gods. He's distinct. He's the creator. This thing I've been saying is unknown. He's the God. He created everything. He rules over everything. He's sovereign over everything. What do I do about that? How does verse 27 start? So that. New King James has so that. I've just told you about the one true God. Now, why did God create you? Why does God rule over everything? Why, why does... Why, why does God give us life and breath and all things? So that, here's the purpose, so that man can find him. God wants to be findable by all people. And I'm going to throw all of these things up here because we're not going to have time to develop all of them in, in depth. 
Verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord. That's why God created man. You want the purpose for man being on the earth? So that they should seek the Lord. In the hope that they might grope for him and find him. I think there is a distinction made here between creation and Scripture. You can see God in creation, but you can find God in Scripture, and you can find His will. Verse 28, For in Him we live and move and we have our very being. We cannot exist independently of God. We, and that's, that's none of us. That's, he's not talking about Christians. He's talking about everybody. Verse 29, Therefore, since we, we, that means Paul the Jew and the Athenians the Greek, we are the offspring of God, all of us. We, we did not originate ourselves. We are not, we, we are not uh, some material that has been made by man. We find our origin in God. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. What's his point? You formed this, God, this, God, this idol, this God, out of gold and silver, and then you bowed down to it. Paul says that's completely illogical. Why, why, why would you ever say that's your God when you made it? He says divine nature is not something that is formed by man's hands. God made man and not the other way around. Very quickly, his application in addition to what we've just seen is that the one true God wants to save all. Truly, that's how verse 30 starts. That's his transition, transition term. Truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked, but no more. But now commands all men everywhere to repent. Look in verse 31. Sometimes we quote verse 30 without verse 31. Because, here's the reason. Why does he command all men everywhere to repent? Because he's a mean God? No, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. And God wants us to be ready for the day of judgment, so he tells us to repent. We'll be judged by the man whom God has ordained. That's the Christ. He has given assurance of this. God has absolutely given a guarantee that he is going to judge all of mankind. And the guarantee is he raised Jesus from the dead. You're an Athenian and you just heard this sermon. What are you thinking? If I'm there, I'm thinking, I need to think about this for a while. I've never thought about anything like that. I, I've, I've never considered anything along this line that there is only one God, only one true God, not many, and that this one God made me and he made me so that I would seek him, not make him, but seek him and find him so that I can be saved and be ready for the judgment day. I think I need to think about that. And so what happens at the end of the sermon? When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, we want to hear you again on this matter. Verse 34, some joined him and believed. Some became Christians. I don't know if the listing of names here is indicative of just how few there were, but there were some people who said, this man's teaching the truth. What he said about the God, there's no other explanation for the truth than what he has presented here. This is what, in my opinion, this is one of the greatest sermons in all of the New Testament. Obviously, they're all great because they're inspired of God. But here is a sermon preached to people who did not believe in God. Tell me what punches Paul pulled. What, 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 what did he hold back? What did he say? Oh, I, I'm not going to give him this one. He unloaded it all. He gave them eight points about the, the God who made them all. He says, you, this isn't something that is possibly the truth. This is the truth about the God. I hope, that's, I hope you've enjoyed this study. This is quicker. I, I think Paul took longer to preach that than just 35 minutes. But um, they, they had to have been, uh, their lives had to have been changed by looking at that.